Now, if you're doing business across borders, one of the challenges you might be familiar with is the pain of making cross-border payments. We were just talking about that one. Often, existing solutions may be costly or unable to be completed fast enough. Melvin Lowe, head of global transaction banking at Overseas Chinese Banking Corporation, will speak to a panel of payment pioneers. And in this panel discussion, we will get a better look at what the challenges are of connecting different payment systems together in order to bring forward a fast cheaper and safer cross-border payment system. Now, this panel consists of Dilip Asbi, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of National Payments Corporation of India, Assistant Governor of Bank of Thailand, Siritira Panomwan Ayudhya, and Lawrence Chan, Chief Executive Officer of NETS, Singapore's Network for Electronic Transfers. Heading over now to Melvin and his panel for this discussion. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today we have a very interesting session. Emerging markets in Asia have been pushing for creation of faster payment systems in each of their domestic economies. As these faster payment systems grow in their popularity, connecting them cross-border to be able to do faster payments and instant payments across borders becomes a, an imperative. We have many players who are doing that today, but none more so than the governments that look to collaborate and build these connectivities. Just this morning, Ravi Menon announced the Prompt Pay Pay Now uh, collaboration, where we will be able to send faster payments between Singapore and Thailand. Today, we have leaders of this transformation from India, Thailand, and Singapore to discuss the opportunities and challenges in establishing these high-speed rails. But no panel will be complete if we didn't stop to consider the impact of COVID. So I'd like to throw the, the questions open. How has COVID driven digital payments in your countries? And I'll ask Dilip perhaps to take the first uh, question. Dilip. Uh, so thanks for having me here. And uh, you know, obviously COVID, uh, like other countries has made a tremendous impact uh, as far as the Indian payment system is concerned. The the first uh, part of COVID is, uh, you know, obviously people didn't have the jobs uh, and, uh, you know, government decided to do a large fund transfers uh, to their accounts using the direct benefit transfer program. So they could get the money back into their account and they could withdraw that and use the, for their livelihood. So this was the first part of the COVID. The second part of the COVID is, you know, the urban users or the semi-urban users uh, wanted to make the contactless payments uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a very, very efficient manner. And this is where uh, UPI or debit cards, contactless debit cards, whatever the India has built uh, as a, uh, in, in last uh, few years, has, been, has come very, very handy to, uh, to the people uh, and the citizens of India. And we saw a great uptake. We saw a great uptake. Uh, we, we saw scan and pay, uh, scan QR code and pay as a big use case emerging in India. We saw link-based payments as a big use case emerging in India. And, and I think the, the digital payments has given a one big push uh, uh, to the digital payments uh, as far as India is concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dilip. And over to Thailand, Kun Shiritida. How has COVID impact, uh, grown or impacted your digital payment journey in Thailand? Yes. Uh, thank you, Marvin. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, to answer your question, uh, Melvin, yes, uh, we see the pandemic uh, has an uh, effect on uh, not only economy, but also uh, cross-border payment and remittance as uh, international uh, travel is not allowed and uh, many trade activities have to uh, suspend, postpone or slow down. In case of Thailand, uh, we observed that uh, the pandemic has uh, resulted a sudden shift from uh, physical to uh, digital activities. Mm. Uh, people change their behavior in uh, daily life. Uh, we see those who rarely or never buy online can now uh, do the daily shopping, uh, order food, transfer money, uh, pay bill, or even make a donation online. Many people have uh, made digital purchase for the first time. And um, we are glad that uh, we have prompt pay. So uh, uh, people can um, transfer fund or make payment uh, as usual from anywhere, even at home. And uh, 
government can transfer uh, emergency relief fund disbursed through Pompeii to those uh, affected by the pandemic directly. Uh, and uh, as for cross-border transaction, I believe uh, that the momentum is growing and uh, we should uh, seek uh, this opportunity to continue building this network uh, of cross-border digital remittance. And this uh, will facilitate cross-border trade and many more interconnectivity in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Kunshri Ritira. And over to you, Lawrence, in Singapore. Clearly, the, 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 the restrictions on travel would have impacted uh, QR payments, merchant payments in Singapore. Do you see that happening? Yes. Um, thanks. Firstly, thanks, Melvin, for um, having me on this. I, I, I think you're, you're, you're very right that the COVID has definitely had an impact on payments. I mean, we all know the major impact of COVID to, to lives. Um, but there's been a great effort, I think, by the Singapore government to, to really try to digitalize transactions, right? Mm. Um, and of course, we've seen a big tick up across the industry from an online purchase standpoint. But in, from an offline standpoint, we've been trying to help the long tail, the smallest of merchants, especially what Singaporeans really like, hawker food, right? <laughs> to, um, to, to be digital. So there's been a lot of incentives that, with, that um, the Singapore government through different government agencies and us NETS have been really trying to, to reach out to these um, small SMEs, to these hawkers, to, for them to be able to take more digital payments. And I think one of the positive things, maybe there are not many things in this um, pandemic uh, mm. situation, but one of the positive things is today, for most of us, we are very familiar how to do a QR. Yes. Because in Singapore, if you want to go into any building, you have to do a safe entry. Almost everyone with a smartphone today will know how to do a QR. Mm. And thus, doing a QR payment at a point of sale is not so foreign as before. Mm. Right? So um, knowing where on the real estate of the phone is your QR and being more comfortable to do that has really helped us uh, not only enable um, the merchants to take digital payments, but I think it's also given the comfort level to to many consumers now to, to use QR at the point of sale. Thank you, thank you. And that's really interesting because if we come out of this COVID situation, I, I want to throw this question to Kun Shiritida. Is there a demand for cross-border digital payments, instant payments? Uh, you mean that the cross-border payment? Yes. Uh, yes. Because uh, I think that uh, Thailand is uh, the, the destination for tourists. Mm. So uh, the demand for uh, digital payment, cross-border digital payment is, you know, is very much. Thank you. And what about Singapore, Lawrence? I mean, do you see Singapore being that, that um, you know, centre of where cross-border digital payments would, would reside? Yes, I, I think we are, we are in a very privileged position because we have over the last few years, managed to bring scale to fast payments, right? In, um, in 2014, Singapore started with fast payments. In mm. 2017, we, as a country, together with the different um, business entities, we launched PayNow, yes. right? So with PayNow and with Fast, uh, launched in 2014, 2017, today we really have scale. Mm. Um, in, in this, in for each month, we have tens of millions of transactions, and pay now contributes nearly half now of all fast transactions in Singapore. So there's there's um, there's a comfort level for people to to transfer money, whether it is person to person, a person to seller, person to merchant, mm. um, through fast fast payments. And I think the natural next step would be how can we leverage this infrastructure that we've built domestically to be leveraged for cross border. Right. So as, as mentioned, as you, as you had mentioned, uh, Mr. Ravi Menon had mentioned that together with, uh, with the Bank of Thailand, um, Pompey Pay now is, is working towards uh, doing that. And it's, it's something that we, we are very, very excited. <laughs> we're very excited because we, we believe that we have, uh, I think one of the prerequisites to do cross-border is that there must be some domestic scale. Yes. Um, and it works domestically. And I think now there's a demand for um, the domestic users who want to do it cross-border. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Now over to Dilip. 
I mean, clearly in India, the, the, the prevalence of UPI, faster payments, is, is strong on a domestic sense. But what are the challenges that you see in taking that cross-border and seeing cross-border inflows and outflows uh, uh, with India? See, today, uh, today India is, a, is, a, is a one of the highest uh, remittance-receiving country. We receive about $80 billion uh, on an annual basis. Uh, so, and we have about 30 million population uh, which is uh, living abroad and uh, they kind of send money to back to their relatives and their uh, uh, friends and, you know, this is kind of used for uh, financial inclusion, the, the economic development. So, this is very, very important issue as far as the India is uh, concerned. So, uh, so, we look at in two, three ways. One is obviously uh, because of there are two different regulators are involved. It is very important that, you know, the Let's assume that even if we take an example of India and Singapore, uh, you know, we have been working very closely with Mass and, and RBI together uh, to, to structure a real-time uh, remittance back to India. We are hoping that we'll finalize the scope and we'll, we'll, we'll try to go live next year. But it is very important that two regulators come together, right? Because a mm. uh, lot of checks and compliances have been deployed by the respective regulators for their countries, right? The second uh, important thing is, uh, you know, I, I'm very sure that the bodies like BIS and World Bank will play a very big role to define the standards, some minimum requirements to carry out this activity so that it becomes like a norm, right? Because today uh, in the payment system, we have uh, we have a lot of cross-border payments and there is a norm, uh, you know, there is Visa, MasterCard, uh, China Union Pay, Amex, and Rupay now trying to be a global uh, payment network along with Discover and Diners, uh, JCB. So, uh, so we require some global setting standard organization to kind of uh, come in and create a global standard. So this is the second uh, issue I would see. The third is obviously the the use of technology, right? You know, today, uh, you know, if and only if the the global remittances will be successful, if we are able to offer the superior consumer experience on both sides, on the sending sides and the receiving sides. So is it very easy to, to, to initiate the transaction, the remittance transaction across countries on a mobile app? Can the sending customer have the full transparency on the rates, on the, on the, uh, on the, on the charges, conversion rates together? And similarly, is there a notification going back to the recipient instantaneously? So, so that the funds are uh, available to use immediately. Once these kind of things happen, we will see dramatic changes in the in the in the in the global remittance volume. And in my assessment, uh, the the ticket sizes will drop, volumes will increase, right? Which is very very good from a from an economic perspective for both the countries, the sending country as well as the uh, as a receiving country. And and I think if we look at these three things, you know, I I, I definitely see that you know global uh, remittances. Uh, would uh, drive a uh, lot of innovation in next uh, three to five years' time. Thank you. Thank you very much, but, Dilip. May and I, mean, now, I, I would yes. like to add uh, Please uh, do. the experience from Thailand. Yes. Yes, and uh, for the faster payment uh, in Thailand, uh, we ex experience uh, the widespread of uh, the usage. Uh, even uh, during the lockdown, uh, our prompt pay and standard uh, QR code payment uh, have become the key means of payment. Uh, there are two reasons for this. Uh, first, the government use uh, prompt pay for disbursement and uh, many supporting programs for individual and small versions via digital payment. And secondly, it is uh, also facilitate e-commerce transaction for online merchants and uh, contact-free payment for offline merchants, reducing the need to touch the bank notes. Mm. And uh, I would like to uh, add some statistic uh, that uh, we see the highest record of uh, e-payment uses. Uh, for example, as of uh, this year, October this year, uh, the number of prompt pay registration uh, were at almost uh, 56 million number and around 34 million are national IDs. I can say that uh, around 52% of Thai population has a uh, prompt pay. And uh, the prompt pay in the bank transaction average per day uh, are around uh, 16 million. 
and marking a new high record, latest uh, peak at 25 million transactions last month. And uh, the Thai QR payment acceptance point have uh, increased to approximately uh, 7 million points all over the country. So I think that uh, this is uh, our journey, and I, I think that uh, customer needs, both uh, private and public, are what we tend to focus uh, and develop digital payment service in the future. Thank you, Kun Shri Tita. And that, those are really impressive statistics. I wanted you to share a little bit more of um, the learnings that you had because you've been very involved in the Prompt Pay, Pay Now uh, project that Ravi Menon announced this morning. Uh, how do you see, what were the learnings for you, I mean, for Bank of Thailand, you know, in, in this uh, journey with, uh, with the Singapore MAS in developing this cross-border connectivity? Mm, yes. Um, I think that uh, the first thing is about the collaboration mm. and uh, the key driver for uh, having uh, innovative cross-border payment and remittent uh, to create fast and secure uh, cost-effective linkage that enhance customer convenience. Mm. Um, so uh, collaboration uh, among ASEAN countries, uh, I think that uh, this is the most important thing. Uh, for for example, uh, at the outset, we initially focused on promoting uh, interoperable QR payment because uh, it is less complicated in terms of uh, both system development and compliance with law and regulation. And uh, after having launched uh, several cross-border payment projects with uh, ASEAN country, uh, we are now uh, emphasizing uh, cross-border remittent. And uh, so the prompt pay, pay now, uh, I think that is this the, the first limitant project linking to faster payment network. Yes. And it's a benefit for both country, collaboration, standard, and uh, security, I think that is the most important and what we learn uh, from this project. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that is really in symmetry with what Dilip was talking about in terms of how the, uh, the, the, the regulators need to come together, how the technology and the, and the, uh, and the minimum standards, the standard requirements are, are needed across. Thank you. But let me switch gears a little bit now to a little bit on what the response will be for the non-financial institutions. So the banks have been involved in the cross-border payment rails on both sides and connecting them. I, I want to turn to Lawrence and ask him, you know, as uh, for non-financial institutions, how do you see them, you know, either competing or even leveraging and riding these rails that are being created by the governments? Thanks, Melvin. So, so in Singapore, it's been announced that um, non-financial institutions uh, can participate in FAS mm -hmm. and can participate in PayNow uh, from Q1 next year. And we have already announced that we have readied the, our systems to, to mm -hmm. enable that. Right? So we, we are opening up, opening up access to, to both send and receive uh, mm -hmm. for, for non-FIs together, together with FIs, mm -hmm. financial institutions in Singapore. And as, as mentioned earlier, I think once we get scale in domestic, then definitely I think there will be a demand then for the domestic users to also want to do that cross-border payment. And I'm very confident that the scale will come. In fact, we have put it into the budget, we've forecasted it, we, we have our systems ready to manage the increase in scale for domestic when the non-financial institutions come on board. Um, and I'm sure there would be, there would be a, a rise in demand for, for the cross-border. For the Pompey Pay Now, at least for our launch, um, as mentioned in March next year, the, initially they will, it will only be the financial institutions uh, mm -hmm. to start with. Um, I think we will go into phases of launch and mm -hmm. over time we will then enable more uh, access to, to other, to other uh, players. But I, I'm, I see that as, as a natural progression, mm. yeah, especially once we get scaled domestically, we will then make it relevant. But 
all these comes with challenges, right? With, with what uh, <laughs> Dilip and Gun Sivitida has mentioned, right? It's, it's bilateral. It's bilateral, so we are great that we have only one person to speak to for now, and, <laughs> we, and we're trying to understand each other so that we can, we can really um, cross every T, dot every I to make sure everything is, is done correctly. Um, but as we want to scale this um, and potentially make this uh, across other, other channels, other, um, other, other countries, then it it's then becomes um, even more exciting, Absolutely. right? When, when we, can, we can make this work across other countries, across fi FIs and non-FIs. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, mm -hmm. but I think, I think it's from a vision standpoint, we can see that coming. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Lawrence. And I want to flip over to Dilip and ask you the same question. You talked about technology and the importance of technology in driving these rails. Uh, how do you think the non-financial institutions, the, the wallet players, the fintech players, will uh, take advantage or compete in the space of cross-border faster payments? See, in India, uh, the, the the regulator has been uh, very, very innovation-led. And uh, mm. since uh, last few years, now the non-bank players have been authorized to play various different roles as well as the payment systems have been concerned. So you see, uh, you know, the in India, if you look at it, who's who, like, you know, Google, WhatsApp, uh, 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 phone, uh, the Walmart-owned uh, uh, phone pay are providing the app services on on UPI. Mm. They are also one side. They are all collaborating back with the banks to provide uh, the the access to uh, to UPI system. So there is a fairly great amount of collaboration exists in India between the banks and fintechs. That's uh, thanks to the uh, to the Reserve Bank of India's uh, uh, policy setting. So we have a very vibrant uh, fintech sector. So when we look at you know connecting the two fast payment systems, two real time payment systems of two different countries, obviously the the fintechs and banks will play a role together. That's that's given. You know I don't think uh, uh, you know anymore we can uh, design a bank only system or a or a fintech only system because both the uh, both the stakeholders are there to complement each other are are there to. Uh, to to create a value add from their side to uh, to make the system richer better for the end consumers so i don't think there is a there is any question that you know the fintechs and banks will play a great role both together to provide the cross border uh, payment systems obviously it would depend on uh, you know the the respective countries the regulator and their uh, willingness to uh, to open up the the market mm. thank you thank you dilip and, and maybe Kunsri Tida, did you have anything in, in Thailand? Do you see the non-financial institution players coming in and uh, you know being very excited about this uh, these faster payment rails and the ASEAN QR? Yes, um, I, I think that our, uh, we see we see that, and uh, when we develop a prompt pay uh, as a payment infrastructure. Uh, one important guiding principle was uh, it must be an open and interoperable infrastructure. Mm. And uh, we carry uh, this principle through uh, the business rule and uh, the implementation. And uh, I think that uh, so lo as, uh, as long as service provider meet uh, the standard, they are open to participate shoulder to shoulder with commercial banks and our uh, this support our intention to uh, create the level of playing field in the industry and uh, induce a healthy uh, completion uh, among players mm, thank you thank you so let me just uh, take us to the next section and talk a little bit about the future state so we are starting on baby steps and we will start to connect our faster payment rails national faster payment rails for cross-border usage what do you see as needed uh, requirements in the future state to drive more of this cross-border uh, collaboration, more of the cross-border connectivity? What will be needed? And I'll, I'll ask Lawrence to maybe start a little bit in, uh, to answer that. Um, well, I, I, I think like for all digital payments, the basic uh, requirement is a very good user experience, a good UX, right? So I think with the with the technology players out there, whether they're fintech or technology, I think we definitely can be more inclusive in trying to 
include different parties to improve the user experience. Today, we are looking at cross-border remittance as one, um, one segment. But as we know that there will be many sub-segments within this one segment of remittance, and within each sub-segment, uh, I'm sure there will be opportunities to specifically target them with different use, um, user experiences that we can bring to these different use cases. Mm -hmm. and so I think from a technology standpoint, we can, I think UX is key. I think what we haven't spoken about in terms of challenges, for example, will be things like uh, AML. Mm. Right? Today, today we're doing it with just uh, one, one, uh, one corridor, Singapore and Thailand. As we try to move to more corridors, we do need to standardize, we do need to come up with, a, with ways in which it can be done in a, in a way that is safe and yet uh, doesn't have too much friction. Mm. And again, I think that's where technology will play a big part in uh, helping improve the user experience and yet not compromising from a safety, security, AML perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Kun Shri Tida, what do you think we could do more to help drive more of this? Is it more technology? Is it more collaboration? How should, what are some of your wish list items to drive further cross-border payment connectivity? Mm, I think that uh, in the near future, there would be more players uh, doing payments, including banks, uh, fintech firm, and not to mention more uh, new technology that will enhance the efficiency of transaction that will uh, stimulate our service provider to uplift our their standard and services. So uh, the benefit will go to customer, which is good. And uh, our perspective, we should open up and embrace more business opportunity, but with uh, adequate uh, risk management or mm. uh, user protection and having a uh, financial stability always in our minds. So uh, I think that uh, we would do more and more for uh, promote uh, payment connectivity uh, amongst uh, countries. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Dilip, on your, on your front, yeah. what's your wish list? <laughs> See, uh, Melvin, you raised a very important point that, you know, the, to, to, to make this real-time cross-border payments possible, I think you require first the domestic efficient payment rates. You know, if we don't have the RTP, well-established RTP, uh, you know, we, we spoke about, uh, uh, Deputy Governor of uh, Thailand spoke speaking about, uh, you know, their prompe and their success. We were talking about the, 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 the fast uh, success in Singapore. We are talking about the UPI success in India. So you, the country needs to have the real-time payment systems. And, and recently, NPCI has uh, started the NPCI International, a subsidiary, to mm. kind of help the countries, help the other countries to have the real-time payment uh, systems uh, equivalent to UPI. So now, once the country has that real-time payment system, the efficient RTP rails, it creates the receive and send infrastructure, right? You know, what it means is, you know, the consumer can receive real time and the consumer can send real time. Mm. Now, tweaking that RTP to do the international payment is not a big job. Mm. You know, once you have the robust uh, domestic infra where you are servicing about millions of customers on a daily basis, once you have that infra turning on the tab on the... Uh, of the international payments is not very difficult because the real-time payment systems what we are advocating are not only the receive and send, they are doing the merchant payments. They have started doing cross-border merchant payments. So already the real-time payment domestic rails have full understanding of the currency conversions, uh, full understanding of the some of the AML checks which are required in the, in the cross-border uh, merchant payment transactions. So layering a international remittance transaction on the uh, the existing RTP may not be that difficult. So I think the starting block in this is is a country having the real-time payment system. And once it's there, I think with the with the like-minded regulators and and G, uh, some of the initiatives like G20, uh, you know, the, the real-time payments, cross-border payments is going to be a reality in the next three to five years' time. Thank you, Dilip. I want to take a, a point that you mentioned, uh, a very interesting point, and maybe 
uh, ask Kun Shiritida to, to perhaps comment and Lawrence to comment as well, which is about helping other countries uh, bring up their real-time payment systems, their RTP payment systems. Uh, how important do you think that is for helping uh, lesser developed countries to, to grow fast, leapfrog, maybe even set up their uh, real-time payment infrastructure uh, in order to create that cross-border connectivity? Kun Shiritida, perhaps some thoughts from you. Yes, uh, I think that we uh, welcome to share our experience that we have uh, in developing uh, the project uh, with uh, PromPay and PayNow. And uh, this is will help uh, other country to like a, a leave frog and not do the same mistake uh, as us. <laughs> I, I think that, uh, yes, uh, Lawrence, uh, he, he knows well. <laughs> Yes, and Lawrence, perhaps some comments on your uh, experience with Nets, you know, and working with different payment systems in other countries. Sure. So, so may, may, maybe let me answer this from from two fronts, right? One, um, even even before we um, uh, grew on scale with with uh, fast and with pay now, in terms of QR payments, we talked about earlier mm. on uh, QR payments that enable point of sale transactions, digital point of sale transactions, cross border. Pre-COVID, we had travellers that came into the market, to Singapore. Mm. But even when we recognised that when the borders were closed, we still had transactions mm. from these uh, foreign players. Mm. Um, well, because Singapore is an international country, um, even when borders were closed, they remain here. Mm. Right? And they still happen to have bank accounts in other countries and therefore were able to use the payment options of the other countries for QR payments here in Singapore, which... Fortunately for us, we were able to support um, and we were able to then enable these buyers to be able to make to buy at the Hawker Centre uh, with yes. a QR payment. Right? So I think for, for cross-border, to me, it's extremely important. Mm. But I, I thought, and as, as what Dilip mentioned earlier on, it's so important to get the domestic scale, the domestic relevance of fast, of fast payments. Mm. Right? And... Um, I think the last I read, maybe two years ago, um, there were 50 over countries today that uh, are on mm. FAST. Within ASEAN, we have more than a handful of markets uh, already on, on FAST. Mm. And I think from what we have seen, even just domestically in Singapore, uh, we'll be, it'll be a privilege if we, can, if we can share our understanding, share our, our technology, uh, to be able to help enable FAST payments to, to happen in, in each country. Mm. But I think as, as it was mentioned earlier by the other speakers, getting it right domestically yeah. is a very important prerequisite before we can even go, go cross-border. Right? So we need to, to do it right domestically, build that scale, build the understanding so that when we go cross-border, even when we receive money from a, a cross-border transaction, we know what to do with that. Right? Mm. We, know, we know it's in our bank account and we can use it domestically or we can, we can reuse the money in a cross-border transaction. So I, I think as we... As we move forward with other markets, um, and other markets would have to make their own judgment, their own calls. But I think getting it, getting it right domestically, driving the scale domestically would be very, be very important. And then we can hopefully in time have that network of different markets where we can do cross-border payments. Thank you. Thank I you just that. like to add uh, yes, uh, a little bit more. I think that uh, there are like a, a three or uh, topics that we should uh, focus on when we do the cross-border uh, payment linkage. Uh, the first one is about the AML CFT screening. Uh, it is very important and we have to ensure that the screening procedure uh, is in line with global practice and uh, the regulator need to maintain the minimum requirement to supervise so with a provider in, in the industry. Secondly, our customer protection. We have to make sure that our customer data will be well protected while maintaining our, the user-friendly experience for customer. And uh, thirdly, it's about the security. Uh, we have to ensure that our, our network security has to be complied with our global standard, our 
to ensure resiliency and availability of the linkage. Uh, uh, and uh, more thing is about the cybersecurity. Uh, it's a very important issue which uh, we as a regulator uh, need to keep close watch and ensure that the link is secure. Thank you. Thank you, Kun Shri Dira. And I, I, I just want to take a, 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 a leap off of what you just mentioned about these three very important uh, uh, factors in ensuring that people are confident in using cross-border remittances through faster payments. Um, security, I mean, cybersecurity is uh, obviously a big topic and, and a big one in this FinTech Festival, I'm sure, as well. Um, how how could we uh, how could our our governments how could the the, the 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 central banks play an important role in 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 helping uh, make sure that uh, you know as we open these rails up to different players to cross border how do we ensure that that uh, element of security is still kept uh, Dilip you would you like to to uh, comment on that in in any way. Mm. So, uh, you know, when we when we look at the the payments, uh, you know, there are already the minimum security standards which has been defined by both uh, the regulator as well as uh, the government. I'm, I think the cross border payments is just an extension of those uh, standards back in. So mm -hmm. whether it's a it's a it's a using the the encryption in the standard uh, uh, messaging using the APIs, whether it's a uh, usage of the, the the network encryption over and above the message encryption, uh, whether it's uh, having the best of the security tools uh, in house to uh, to screen the messages, to see the traffic, to monitor the user behavior, those kind mm. of things. So I think I think the countries which are doing the domestic payments well, right? You know we are fairly aware about the what is the requirement. And I don't see that you know the increasing adding up the international remittance uh, will create more uh, uh, more work on our side. Obviously, the the AML and CFT screening uh, softwares has to be deployed, but I don't think that's a very hard uh, job, mm. in my opinion. Thank you, thank you. And Lawrence, on your side, is there anything that you would like uh, uh, regulators to get more involved with or, or uh, to to help? Uh, make the systems more secure and build the confidence. Yeah, I mean, the, we, we are as strong as the weakest link, right? Mm. And that's not on the market level, but in the individual player yeah. level, whether it's FI or we talk about potentially even non-FI yes. uh, jo joining the, the ecosystem. So yes, I, as I totally agree with what Dilip said. I think from a cyber security standpoint, whether it's domestic or cross-border, to me, the risk is equally the same, right? Uh, it's, it's if if they can hack for domestic, it will be hacked for, for cross border. It doesn't really increase, and really the increased risk from a cross border is the AML KYC uh, perspective, and that's that's I think for, from that risk standpoint, as, as mentioned earlier on, I think um, we can do we can do more to bring more more standardization, more um, better user experience to mm -hmm. to um, to reduce friction and to to gain gain trust. Right mm -hmm. um, across, but I, I, I think the I think from a from a regulator standpoint, as I said today today we're starting bilateral. We are learning a lot. We are very excited. Mm. Um, but I think the opportunity for us to to grow uh, to become a network of different corridors that'll be really exciting. And that's where I think not just the regulators have to come together, but I think even the commercial entities will have to come together. To, mm. to to make this make this work right, and it cannot be and cannot and will and should not be done as a as a part time thing, right? Yeah, because th this this is this is the, this can really benefit many people, right? Can really benefit many of our citizens across many across our markets, and um, and it also is a huge commercial opportunity over time. Thank you, thank you. So we're we're coming up to the last minute or so of our session. Uh, I just like to. Uh, uh, go around the, 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 the various uh, our, our three panelists here uh, to see whether they have any last thoughts to share with the audience. Uh, Kun Shri Tira, would you like to share a few last words? Yes, um, I believe that uh, after the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, things will not be the same. Mm. And uh, technology will play an uh, important role in the way we lived and do the business. 
to help ac access to more efficiency, more convenience, more customer with less cost. Yes. And uh, for uh, in ASEAN country, uh, we uh, have started bilateral project with our other countries such as uh, interoperable uh, QR payment with Lao PDR, mm. Cambodia and Japan and cross-border remittance with Singapore and more to come in the future. Uh, at the end of the day, I see uh, a network of payment and remittance linkage forming, which will be a game changer, driving the cross-border transaction that will be support the growth uh, of our international trade and e-commerce, and the flow of tourism, and the livelihoods of our migrant worker. Again, I think that it benefit to our stakeholder. Thank you, thank you. And Dilip? Last words from you. Uh, yeah, two things. Uh, one is uh, I fully agree with Chitra that uh, you know the, the the COVID has emphasized for a country to have a efficient, cost-effective, real-time payment trails, and I think it's 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 uh, it, it has been uh, really highlighted now. And most of the regulators worldwide who do not have the real-time payments are are looking forward to implement that. The second point is you know when we come here next year uh, for the Singapore FinTech Festival, hopefully. The two corridors, you know, the, the the Thailand to Singapore and Singapore to India, would be live, <laughs> and uh, for the cross-border remittance payments, and 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 in that panel next year, we would be discussing how do we replicate this model worldwide. Absolutely, thank you, thank you, Dilip and Lawrence. I'll just add to that by saying that the more the more successful we are, the stronger our purpose, the more imp uh, the stronger the impact we can have on our communities. Right, and I think we, we owe it to our communities to really make this work and, and make it work well. So really looking forward to this really exciting journey. And thank you very much. And on that note, I'd like to thank Kun Shri Dida, Dilip and Lawrence for a wonderful session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melvin. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. That's right. Thank you all. Uh, very good to catch up with that conversation uh, and some really impactful points coming from it. I think when we talk about payments across borders, it's important to remember and um, how much that can improve people's lives. Pervasive electronic payments and affordable cross-border remittances uh, can really be a boost for economies everywhere. Uh, so that was solving cross-border challenges, the roadmap to connecting faster payment systems on the panel just then, Dilip Asbe. Managing Director and CEO of the National Payments Corporation of India, or NPCI. We're going to be hearing more about that later in the session over the Singapore FinTech Festival today. Uh, Lawrence Chan, the CEO of NETS, and Shrutida Panawamana Ayuda, who is the Assistant Governor of the Bank of Thailand. And moderating that conversation was Melvin Lowe. Our thanks to Melvin. He is the Head of Global Transaction Banking at OCBC. So thank you, everyone, on that panel. And with that, we have actually come to the end of the Asia Pacific Zone of the Infrastructure Summit here as part of the Singapore FinTech Festival 2020. Don't worry if you have missed some of the key sessions. That includes our highlight fireside chat with Bill Gates. I managed to catch it and I highly recommend you do too. You'll be able to access the recording of that session on our event website. There are a number of thumbnails that are appearing of all of our spotlight sessions. But do stay with us as we continue to the Europe Middle East and Africa zone. Keep walking, stay connected. We can never plan for the unexpected like COVID, but we should keep walking and marching towards the right directional, following our dream, our vision. Ultimately, man can propose, but God disposes. So how to maintain and further our connectivity are vital for us to stay competitive and stay in the game. In my eyes, as a leader, especially as a FinTech leader, must be someone to be able to embrace and appreciate Fin plus tech.